Jacob, good to see you, my friend. It's a, it's a delight. And Michelle, as always, of course. And Dimitri, thank you for going through the Hegel's justification of Hegel. I appreciate that very much. That was kind of you, and I enjoyed yesterday, the other day so much. And Javier, you've been on fire with your videos lately. Look at this guy. Uh, the one on gaslighting was fascinating, anxiety. I really liked what you had to say on the vision, the way you used the vision and plans distinction a lot. I thought that was really interesting. And uh, I, I also really like what you were saying in academia of the like, uh, oh, we don't read them anymore, you know, kind of dismissing things. I thought I thought you were going to actually end up punching the screen. Uh, it was really great. It's what I was my favorite, just seeing your reaction today. Is that extremely prevalent? I, I mean, I was just kind of shocked that, you know, like I, I was just she just said, don't use philosophers. And then just randomly she says, oh, yeah, you know, because like Foucault is a pedophile. So and I, I was like. Uh, I, I didn't even bring up Foucault, but I can tell how you feel about it. And then I'm like, what about Japanese philosophy? How do you feel about that? She's like, I mean, because it is a Japanese culture class. So, um, and she's like, I haven't read Japanese philosophy. And I'm like, okay. I mean, I guess the conversation can stop here. <laughs> That's how I feel. <laughs> Well, it is interesting. Like you say, you don't bring up Foucault and that's brought up. And I, but it is interesting how, well, it makes me think, I've been thinking a lot about the difference between what I almost want to call critical thinking and critique thinking, where critique thinking is where you say, oh, he's a pedophile. Oh, he was stupid. Oh, he was a bad person. And it feels like critical thinking because it feels like you're seeing to the truth beneath the surface. But it's like we need to make a distinction now between critical thinking and critique thinking. And I was talking kind of to Sanduni about that as well, where I wish almost we didn't call critical thinking critical thinking because it creates the impression that a deep thinker is someone who is critical. Now, it of course means what you, it depends on what you mean by that. And there is something to be said. I know um, those individuals at the store were talking to Christopher and, and Dr. Verveke about how the liminal web, the online space doesn't have enough criticism. So it becomes a bubble and everyone. So I'm not saying that critique is bad, but there's a difference between cheap critique and costly critique. Like cheap critique is where it's kind of that Bonhoeffer distinction I like so much where you just say, oh, this sucks. And I just think there are game theory dynamics which incentivize people to critique because you're automatically have power in the conversation. Like if I say, oh, this person, you know, this person is, um, you know, a pedophile, like with, with, with Foucault, it's as if you now, people have to um, explain to you why that doesn't count. Like you have power in the conversation, right? And so that's the danger of the, tre tr the, um, the cheap critique. But then, of course, there is the problem of yes men, confirmation bias, and all these different things. So it's almost like you have to have a conversation now on costly criticism and cheap criticism. Like, what is a valid criticism? But you see, a valid criticism would require someone to probably go into the system and think it through to determine that, right? And they've decided that they're justified not to do that, right? So it basically seems... Now, of course, wouldn't that mean, though, that the only things you could criticize are the things that you deeply explore or that you go into? Kind of does. So, you know, choose your battles, right? Choose the areas that you're going to go into. But I think about that a lot. And then whoever wants to respond, please. And, and like I was mentioning, it's, it's grass cutting season on the farm. So, and I'll give it to Dimitri here. But I've been thinking a bit on critique, you know, um, critique thinking and critical thinking. There's different ways to language it, but let me pass it to Mr. Dimitri here. Yeah, I, uh, I completely agree with that. And I myself, I never liked the term critical theory, like as if it was inherently good to be critical. <laughs> And I think psychoanalysis is really kind of the opposite of that, because I was even I was talking to Michelle about this the other day that you in like in in, in psychoanalysis on the couch, obviously as, as a psychoanalyst, your job is not to critique the analysant when he's uh, telling you about his symptoms, and because actually like that would put a stopgap on that process or like being self-critical about their symptoms can even put a stopgap there right so you can conceal more by being critical of yourself than to really go into uh, the actual thing like what's actually going on and there seems to i think it's very important that you know yes thinkers philosophers have, have a, or like people in general have a sensitivity to um 
like the otherness of the other to put it in this in this way and what you get in a lot of i would say like leftist uh, woke culture is that you would critique things if they do not fit a certain moral framework whereas you know like it seems very good to do because then you know we you establish yourself as a morally correct and things like this um but yeah yet again i think like cultivating a certain kind of you know like um, t taking a step back and really letting the others speak on and at understanding it on their own terms has way more value almost always <laughs> and um what i mean with this sensitivity is like like uh, recently i've been watching some uh, documentaries on interrogation rooms where there's like a detective and a person who like a mass murderer or something like this right and there's like teens uh <laughs> there also and um of course it's all horrendous it's it's yeah it's it's uh it's 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 a horror but like you're that doesn't make you understand it you know and this is i mean it's kind of started with nietzsche i think hannah arendt uh really went into this well with her like banality of evil and freud obviously made use of this so i think morality here is especially a problem you know like and that's what she used against you if you're like oh yeah he's a pedophile so we don't listen to anything that he says <laughs> yeah so that's just uh that's for me. oh yeah well it makes me think um it's interesting because i remember in the early 90s where so for example it was very prevalent in um say religion or christianity to say oh this movie is um you know not worshiping jesus therefore you should not see it therefore it is a bad movie Right. You know, you've had a tendency of censorship that has been widespread in religion. It's just very interesting how the and, that, and that's a kind of moral ground, too. Right. Like it would be unethical to let someone watch this movie because it might send them to hell or something. Right. And so there's an ethic behind all of that. And it's interesting. And Jonathan Rauch's book, Kindly Inquisitors, which I think is the best book on that problem. Um, 1994, this was way before any of the stuff that everyone talks about now. And he was just kind of warning. He's like, there is something about uh, human, you know, without the ability to talk about ideas, then we have no way to test ideas to determine good ideas from bad ideas. And that creates all sorts of problems. And basically, he was kind of in that book making this distinction between critical, you know, um, costly criticism and cheap criticism. And his worry was, he said, guys, if you do the cheap criticism stuff, it's literally going to make um, the quality of knowledge less because you're not going to be able to test ideas. All ideas necessarily present themselves as good. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been written. Like if they're in a book, they're probably not just a passing notion, right? Someone has really thought about them. They probably have some degree of evidence to them. Like when you start talking like, books and thinkers and whatever it's there there there's it's not self-evident what is true and what is false you have to do the work right um well that would require the ability to go into the work and to determine these different things and if you can't do it then you get all sorts of um issues and i think what javier said in the video about ideas being like tools it, it does remind me about the debate of you know obviously you could get into first amendment you know second amendment stuff and different things on the idea of does the hammer if someone uses a hammer to hit somebody uh, does that mean hammers are bad, right? So are ideas like tools, right? Where they have a life of their own independent of the thinker or not. And I think it depends. I mean, you could make an argument, like if you could literally, but this would, this would take a lot of work, right? Like if you could literally argue that essentially the thinking of Heidegger leads to Nazi, Nazism. Like Heidegger's thinking is inseparable from a political structure of Nazism, well, that would be a strong case, right? Like that would be a different, you would now have kind of earned a case, right? But that's what you would have to do, right? Is to make that, basically that would mean you would have to argue that the philosophy of Heidegger is impossible. If it were to arrive in um, Madagascar, it would create fascism there just as much as in Germany. You see what I'm saying? Like the idea, no matter where you put it, it would give rise to the same political structure that would prove the ideas themselves are essentially that you know nazi right now of course there gets into questions of okay but there's something about heidegger's thinking that leads to 
Nazism or has a higher propensity to do these things, right? Well, then you have to go through and figure all those different things out. And I will note, um, and then I'll pass it back to you, Dimitri or Jacob. I see you're unmuted, so please, it's good. And uh, I hope you had a nice trip, by the way. Uh, good man. And it, it makes me think too, like when we talk about woke, you know, I think about Blackness Visible by Charles W. Mills, the Jamaican Jamaican um, philosopher, who it's a brilliant book on uh, on Black philosophy, what it like minority philosophy and different things. Really, really brilliant work. And I consider that. A a costly critique like that's that's worked that's earned um and also the book eraser by uh Persbet, which talks about the difficulty of your if you're an african-american in america and you just want to write a novel about greek culture the publisher's like well aren't you going to talk about what it's like to be black in america and it's like no i just want to talk about greek mythology and how there's this kind of expectation that a black writer has to talk about being black even if they themselves want to just talk they have a love of greek mythology and that's what they want to write on and how there's that indirect no one's like oppressing, but there's this like expectation that kind of forces you on. That's a powerful idea. That's an earned idea though, right? Because he wrote the entire novel and he went through those things. And those are things that America has to think, right? We have to think those things. But that's very different from just a um, critic, cr critique thinking, I believe. But let me pass it. May I briefly, Dimitri? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, sir. First of all, really nice to be here with you all again. I just watched the previous Nat, and it was terrific. I learned a lot. Um, so thank you for that. I feel like there's a really live through line in this about critique. And what came up for me is that it's somehow conflict without intimacy. Or it's like conflict that doesn't want intimacy. So it's at a distance. And... For many years when I was younger, I was, you know, focused on this whole Islam and the West conflict. And you see a lot of people starting out in that in the same way as like conflict at a distance. And I had to undergo this process of becoming intimate with it in order to actually um, get a deeper understanding of the nature of the conflict. And there's this idea that Jordan Hall had put forward that's just been circling around in my head which is waging peace and waging peace yeah it's just that phrase is like drawn down and become very significant for me and i think it that like that the idea of an actively won piece of a waged piece of peace that kind of maybe sublates conflict energy or, or something like that uh is something i'm exploring both at a interpersonal and a big collective level as well so i wanted to uh to throw those pieces in that's a lovely phrase waging peace i like that so much and samantha great to see you my dear i hope you're doing well emilio good to see you and samantha has a wonderful example of going in and using kafka to show where you're going to be talking about how today people like when women are having children or in their in birth wards kafka in the penal colony that's using as a critique of the culture that is happening today on how women are treated when they give birth. Well, that's earned though, because you have to go into the text, you have to work through Kafka, you have to think about comparing it with the world today. And that would be an example of what you're talking about, a costly critique where you're going in and you're working things. But again, it's it's interesting to me, this difference between um, a, you know, critique thinking. So Samantha, Miss Green and Amelia, we've been talking about the difference between critique thinking and critical thinking uh, and how that gets into censorship sort of thinking and all those different things. And what does it mean to look like? Because there's a problem of confirmation bias, right? Where you never get cri criticized and you're just in your own bubble. But then there's also this other problem, which is a, oh, we don't read, you know, Foucault because he did some terrible things, right? You know, it's a terrible person. So we're done with Foucault. And there seems to be a difference. I think you can find a much more interesting critique in Foucault if you compare the early Foucault with the later Foucault and how there seems to be a division in his thought that starts to kind of come out and develop and how does that transform him? But that would require going into the text. So that was generally, but let me pass it to Dimitri Titan, who, please. I will uh, read a relevant uh, Hegel quote from the Science of Logic. It's in the chapter on being for itself when he's going into the dialectics of uh, repulsion and attraction. He says, Although negative, repulsion is nonetheless essentially connection. The mutual repulsion and flight is not a liberation from what is repelled and fled from. That which is excluded still stands in connection with what is excluded from it. But this moment of connection is attraction, which is thus within repulsion itself. 
It is the negating of that abstract repulsion by which the ones would each be in existence referring only to itself without mutual exclusion. So in other words, attract, uh, repulsion is attraction. And to be like, to oppose that you're you know, re repulsed by something until some kind of retraction, you're not liberated by being connected with that very thing. And to this extent, you know, that yes, there's a difference between uh, cheap critique and costly critique, but like in a sense, the cost of cheap critique is even higher <laughs> because you're caught up with something and you cannot liberate yourself from it and truly be like indifferently intimate with it, which is very interesting that, you know, Hegel ends, if we ignore the whole section on, on quantum and measure, like Hegel ends the, the doctrine of being with indifference, which is like, an I would assume like also an indifference to attraction and repulsion and all of the different um, logical forms in the doctrine of um, of being. And yeah, it seems like going into that, into that intimate indifference where, is where we can actually mediate some essential uh, notions. Well, that was a lovely comment. You timed it well with Mr. Ebert, where you were talking about the repulsion and that being formed. So it's good, Mr. Ebert. Good to see you, sir. It's a pleasure. And there is something, it, it makes me think like with Derrida, there was this notion that the way you critique something is not by like pulling against it because that actually makes you closer. Like if you don't own the repulsion as part of the process, it makes it worse. Derrida's like, no, let's go into Der let's go into being in time and let's see what he has in the footnotes. Derrida loved to go into the footnotes of books because he's like, usually the weak points of arguments are hidden in the footnotes or in the end notes or whatever, where they, they're like, those are where the secrets are. And he loved to go into books. And he's like, oh, let's follow that number where he doesn't define the seemingly important term. He's acting like he's going to define it. Then you go to the end note and there's nothing there. Oh, hmm, funny. And so for him, so often, like critique can be found in the text if you just pull on the thread. <laughs> but you have to go in and find the thread and pull. But notice there, that's not where Derrida is being, like he's going into it. He's owning it and going into it as opposed to working against it. And the feeling of repulsion for him was evidence that if you went into the text, you might actually find a thread you can pull on. See, that's the thing. Like repulsion for him was evidence of needing to go more in, right? Uh, it was like an intuition that there might be something. And then it's like it dissolves almost into that absolute indifference or it dissolves, you know, equilibrium if we use that language and different things. But let me give it to Chitan and then Michelle. Chitan, good to see you, sir. Hi, yeah, you wonderful comments in that sense. Yes, the idea of deconstruction is actually very important here to think because the work of the deconstruction in that sense, um, you know, whether we like the terminology or not, what we orient, you know, but Dalida's the idea of the work that goes in deconstruction is actually extremely important in that sense to differentiate the costly from the, you know. Uh, in, in that sense. And that's what Derrida was trying to think about, that that can you think of a text on its own terms in that sense? That And that is where he he started his thinking on deconstruction in that in that sense, that, that the very opposite of that text lies within the text itself and it's through that work that, you know, um, there's some, something emerges in that, in that, in that sense. Um, uh, there's just sort of my, my, my sort of brief sort of cut in that, in that situation is that Often this problem of this idea of costly and, uh, you know, uh, cheap in that sense, uh, critique, the cheap critique can hide in the form of the costly critique. It can almost always take the clothes of the costly critique. You know, you can even do a certain kind of work, which is, which looks like work, which is, which is meaningless work in that sense. You know, and, and, and no matter what standard you set for that work, that work can always, it's almost like a mask. The cheap can always find a mask from which it can look like the costly one. And you, you can find many textbooks, many academic works in, the, in that sense. And in that in that context, we need to start thinking. And another way to think of critique, as, as I think uh, Daniel said, is the issue of thinking with something, thinking against something. Because thinking against something automatically positions you in, in that sense of, you know, and of course, there also this, this question of masking immediately starts to come about. And one can see this distinction critical and critique, uh, uh, almost uh, getting that that the, that, the, that the problem of critique, critical in that sense, lies within critique it, itself. The, the contradiction lies within the critique itself in, 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 in that sense. And if you look at the sort of certain history of critique, starting from say Kant to Horkheimer school, you know, the German uh, coming down to, you know, uh, Foucault, French, 
in 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 that in that in that space one can see the critic has a very interesting sort of tangent uh, sort of parallel story to reason you know this coming up of reason modernity and it it is coming up of modernity that something a word like critic became important because critic has this this capacity to be the other side of truth it can find truth in, on on be on being the other of the truth in that sense you know that if i am telling you this is my truth kitty can find its way through it kitty has that capacity to be you know traversing traversing this 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 these lines of truth in 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 that sense in which is why critical theory critical thinking uh, critique of pure reason all of these sort of texts become important because they were trying to um traverse the problem of truth in that sense of you know positing something as this is my truth and this is my false so the word has very many interesting um uh, dimensions uh, one can one can i, I think I discuss that what what has that word come down to today and what does it mean to us and i would be interested to see what you know that how do we personally take that word in, in our lives and in, in our times today and what do we do with it <laughs> yeah <laughs> Excellent comment. I'll give it to Michelle and then Mr. Ebert. I um, it makes me think of the biography on Alan Greenspan. You know, Greenspan. What was you, what was you trying to do during those press conferences? Say a whole lot of things that sounded extremely complicated that would answer every question. At the end, I said absolutely nothing so that the markets didn't react. Uh, and every chairman has basically tried to do the same thing. How do I say a lot of stuff? That sounds like I'm saying something and it sounds really smart, but it actually doesn't mean anything. Uh, and it also makes me think my, my beloved William Wilson once said that most academic books should be essays and most essays should be sentences because the majority of them are actually just like nothing. Uh, now, that obviously is not all the case, but you're exactly right. Something that looks costly can actually be cheap. Uh, so I think what you're saying about it, well, that would also go into... The, then the question is, what is the criteria for determining criti um, criti um, cheap versus costly, right? How do you determine that criteria? What does it look like? It's not necessarily word count. It's not near. It's not necessarily length. It has something to do with quality. Well, what is that quality, right? You know, how do we determine that quality um, in things of that nature? I think it's a very good question. I'll give it to Michelle. Yep, just really quick. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say that. Um, you know, it's it's kind of a question for for regarding the topic of um Javier's video on you know um, academia and like you know this this whole idea of like you know um you know this uh, this kind of repulsion all of that like but is, do you think that so it's a question for Javier and for who any, whoever wants to answer but like is there is there like a solution in terms of how to remedy this on you know campuses or wherever this is occurring but you know um or is it just like well I guess they're doing that and I'm not gonna do that but you know kind of like to each his own I mean I don't know is that is that what it's going to end up boiling down to I just feel like I mean I and I, I it's it, to me it's just very stifling for generative thought you know to do that because it's kind of like well what can we think about and I understand even the thought to not think about certain people or not read certain people is itself something that perhaps should be honored but you know like if everybody thought well we can't read these people we can't read these people for that reason we'd never like who would we be able to read you know like how you know what I'm saying? So, anyways, that's kind of my question. Um, thanks. Javier broke down into tears in front of his teacher. That's what worked. And the teacher's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So Javier, so breaking down into tears helped solve it when the professor was like, no, you can't do that anymore. And I will say here quickly, and then give it to Mr. Ebert. I always think like, as I understand it, in um, some Druish traditions, you're not supposed to read like the Kabbalah until like you're 40. So there is something to be said about some books having an intensity that maybe there's a wisdom and a conditioning and an awareness of what age and so on and so forth. You know, it's like uh, when I read Hegel when I was like 20, I wasn't ready for Hegel, right? You know, so, and there's a sense in which it was almost bad because then I was like, the Germans are stupid. And I thought I would never go back to them, right? So there is, I think, space in the conversation for some sort of awareness of conditioning. But then, of course, that's dangerous because who decides what's that and what's what and so on. But uh, Mr. Ebert, good to see you today, sir. I hope you're doing well. Hello. Um, so the thing about, uh, I'm just following along, and I don't understand the difference that you guys are describing between cheap and costly, but um, I don't think I care so much at the moment, because I have something else to say about this. Um, critique is always superficial. Um, it cannot help but be, the very act of observation superficializes and, uh, and collapses into representation. That representation can never address the interiority of a subject. Critique, if it's fueled by language, 
is going to be the act of superficializing, the act of creating a mask upon something and de determining that that act. In fact, uh, Hegel says something like, um, the mind, the act of judgment, uh, something like, I can't remember the exact quote, but something in effect that basically mind is the act of judgment and that that act of judgment is the collapse into determinate form. It cannot address the interiority, the indeterminate. Critique cannot address that. So alterity or otherness being irreducible to representation, um, I think is, is key when we think about what critique is, uh, is it costly, is it cheap? It's always cheap, um, in my view. Like all critique is cheap. However, cheapness is the language of the profound. So we can't avoid this and we can't simply strive for profundity in language because you will be absolutely posing. You're just a poser when you do that. And I've done this. I can speak from experience. I've done this, I know. So when I see other people do this, I know and recognize it. It simply can't be done. You can approximate it with contradiction. So that's why a lot of Hegel's language is contradictory. A lot of Buddhist language is form is emptiness, emptiness is form, turn it'll break your brain. But the it still exists on the superficial plane and it's approximating uh, the essence. And that's why, you know, to me, um, we need to learn to really enjoy being misrepresented. We need to really enjoy being uh, misidentified um, and understand that our essence can never be properly identified because that would mean that we have uh, only a singular uh, 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 determinate essence and that we no longer have a soul, essentially. For our indeterminacy to be identified, it must collapse into determinacy and thereby not represent us. So we get to, that, and that's the definition of privacy in a certain sense, is the joy of experiencing our own indeterminate interiority that really no one else will get to experience unless we link up with someone and they're in the state where they're enjoying their interiority, which is isomorphic to yours because it's indeterminate, it's the same as yours, or it can be put in full resonance with yours. And that's when suddenly you get into these moments once in a while where you're looking at someone and they see you and you see them and there's no words that you can put to this, but suddenly you're in this uh, uh, imminent camaraderie with them. Excellent comment. I'll pass it to Javier and Chichan. For me, there is something about critique that reminds you that the shallow and the surface matter. We tend to believe that shallow is bad, deep is good, or that surface is bad, depths are good. And critique is a reminder that the shallow is just as much part. You can't have a planet, you know, you can't have a world unless you have ground to walk on. So it's just as important. And I suppose, you know, we were kind of talking about the difference between the criticism that says, oh, I don't like philosophy, therefore, and philosophy is bad, as opposed to going in saying philosophy doesn't, you know, maybe you go in and you really work it through and say, these are the reasons why philosophy is bad and so on and so forth. So very generally. So what you're saying makes me think of the difference of criticism that makes you realize that the surface matters and criticism that makes you think service doesn't matter. Because there's a lot of people that will like critique in a manner that makes you go, oh, those are the shallow people. They don't know what they're talking about. And you actually go more into the deep versus the, versus the well, like the presentation, hopefully, like with David Hume and Hegel. Like David Hume is like, hey, the surface matters. Like if you forget the surface, you're going to go off in that auto cannibalism that we were describing, right? But also David Hume is not saying that the surface only matters. That's why he's fighting back against the common sense arguments of Hutchinson and other people of, uh, of the Scottish Enlightenment. And he's trying to fight back between, you know, you could say, a cheap, um, a cheap, uh, a cheap critique of philosophy versus a costly critique of philosophy. Because, and he's like, you can never forget the surface. And it, it makes me think um, too. With that, is it makes me think what you were saying about being open to misrepresentation. One of the most valuable things I ever learned personally from a lot of the creative writers, whether it had been Marilyn Robinson, uh, Walker Percy, you can go on, is like they always issue like you are creating a text that people are going to that is going to be interpreted beyond your intention. And that's the joy of it. Like you don't write a novel getting upset if people misinterpreted from what you intended. You create a thing knowing darn well 
that it is going to create a whole network of different views and interpretations. And you own that. And the best novelists do own that. Uh, and if you don't own that, you end up, you get so concerned that people are going to misinterpret your book or get the wrong message that it becomes propaganda, basically, or it becomes a mouthpiece. So what you're saying makes me think of what the best novelists own, is that the work um, will have a life of its own and that you must find joy in that even if people interpret the work in a manner that you don't like. You still have to find joy in the interpretation you dislike because that is part of the game. So it makes me think of what you were saying there that I like. And Javier, I'll give it to you and then Chita. I really liked what uh, Ebert said here. Um, it's something that I, I personally struggle with because I, you know, the moralization is so deep with uh, when you bring up thinkers like Heidegger or Foucault um, you know, when my, my when my professor said, oh, you know, Foucault is like a, pe a pedo, so we don't engage. Um, it made me instantly think, so if I'm caught reading Foucault, immediately I'm going to be misrepresented just by virtue of reading him, just by that judgment, right, alone. And I talked about this in my video where it's like you could go through some type of paranoia about this because fundamentally you're going to be misrepresented. <laughs> and and I, I, I know that I really struggle with this because it's like, no one's no one's really taught how to die through misrepresentation. <laughs> you know, I, I am still struggling with how do I die knowing that I'm going to be misrepresented and knowing that I also participate in that misrepresentation of myself, you know. And so I, I'm left with those questions and I'm constantly struggling with that. And that's why I ended with my videos. Like, I understand that I'm fundamentally alienated. Um, and... But yeah, I, I I do think there is an art to the critique, and and um, <laughs> and uh, I I think Ebert makes a good point on on this. Like uh, critique, it seems like we have to be careful in the sense that we know that if we make critique, it's just a provisional line. That that is out. That that line, once that line is made, it's superficial now. You know, um, and then you got to make another line, and then that becomes superficial. It like it's a constant work at this thing. So like, I understand, I, if I'm understanding Ebert correctly, I feel like I understand what he's saying, but yeah. I'm looking forward to your class, Javier. Yeah, how to die in misrepresentation. It's going to be great. Let me pass it to Chichan and Emilio. Good to see you, my friend. Yeah, I think it's a, you know, it's, it's a great point to think about this question of misrepresentation in critique and, you know, surface in that sense. And of course, you know, one thing is that, that that mask, it's, you know, do not try and go behind the mask, as Jack would say. You know, mask itself is the... Because eventually the cut at the origin is never completely visible at the origin. Even if it is, it's usually missed. It, it, you know, it's only the cut at the origin itself get, that gets visible in the mask in that sense, you know, now, later on. So mask itself becomes the point of the origin itself. The unconscious is on the surface itself, you know, as, you, as, you, as we try and think about that. The interesting thing about critique, although, uh, you know, and I, I get this, you know, I, I get this, this inertia for being in the post-critique world in our time that we're living in. You know, we want to, go, in some sense, go past critique in, in, in our times. But I think uh, I, I, I'm personally very, very slow in that movement, at least myself. And I have a very particular reason for that. Uh, one is that once we move from what you call the sacred hierarchies to secular hierarchies, you know, that's what the movement of modernity essentially entails, that certain things which could be done automatically now have to be done with with, with certain use of reason in, in that sense. For instance, how to organize a society, what the law should be, and so on and so forth. And uh, critique, as I said, simultaneously emerges from the secular hierarchies. As, 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 that's, that's a historical emergence in that sense. Um, what I mean by this is that critique emerges from that zone where I can tell you to do something based upon that I am telling you the truth. I have a claim on truth which comes through certain engagement of reason in that sense and critique becomes a point through which you traverse that claim. Which is why, you know, for, when Foucault writes his sort of article on what is critique, he puts critique on the side of, in some sense, a legal problem. You know, in, in, that, in, in, that, in that sense, that it is, a, it is a question of how not to be governed. That's the line language that he uses in that sense. That there is some, something of a government, governmentality at stake at the original critique itself. You know, it's not a question that whether you accept the truth or believe in the truth or not. It's a question that any response to a language of truth has to involve some basis in critique, no matter how cheap it is. Uh, 
you know that's the, that's the, that's the challenge that how do you formulate a language which is which doesn't have any shade of critique but can still respond to reason that becomes the question and how do you form a language of that nature you know and that question is there with us all throughout that today also if i come and tell you a truth and i impose it upon you in some degree and, and you know and you you want to traverse that imposition even if you agree with that truth let's accept let's you know let's let's both accept that you agree with that truth for something as as simple as you know you should tell your, send your child to school you know let's let's say that and you agree with it but i come from the outside and i tell you you should send your child to school there is a point over there where you would want to respond to that truth in a manner that you 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 get some space for freedom some space for your own thinking in that act you may not want to do it simply because i told you to do it and it is in that in that minimal disengagement from that truth that critique exists critiques eventually find its space within in that minimal disengagement that is possible uh, from that that immediate imposition and which is why i am i i i am very um, cautious about leaving that ground completely i understand it as i said the cut exists in the critique itself the problem exists in the critique itself i take that point completely you know i i'm not trying to place the burden of critique out, outside of critique in, in that matter foucault tried to do that to some degree for foucault critique also was a relationship between knowledge and action and he's right about it that that if you want to find alternate ways to to traverse relationship between knowledge and action you need something like a critical attitude to to emerge in that in the, in, in in that space and critique in is is pharmacological to the extent that it can also block new relationships possible as i said you know you can you can dismiss something to exist uh, to come into the conversation or to be misrepresented by in the name of critique and at the same time to allow yourself to be misrepresented is also critical thing it also demands a certain certain kind of critical attitude from your side that you allowing somebody to misrepresent yourself this wasn't possible before this transition secret hierarchy secular hierarchies you know this idea that i can i am allowing myself to be misrepresented completely so what is that stake in it I, i'm not sure how, how everybody else thinks about it yeah thank you that's a lovely comment i'll give it to emilio and alexander uh mr ebert um it makes me think uh but i'm crying because i just had the honor and delight of doing a presentation on this on the counter enlightenment and the modern counter enlightenment um a way i think about it is very often when you go through history you'll see an ism and a postism and they're going back and forth and people think the response to the ism is the postism but then there's this movement that's completely ignored that tends to be the counter of it that's uh that actually is doing a lot of what you described that i really like how you described it like critique but the space for the reason of the critique and different things like when you go back you had um like transcendentalism and romanticism tends to be response to the scientific revolution and modernism but they're still kind of in the back and forth of like in the post that structure to the side of all of that is counter enlightenment thinker with people like Vico and and Marcel and these different people and they're all absolutely concerned about leaving nature out of your thinking in regard to um philosophical or scientific thinking but they're not transcendentalists they're not emerson they're not romantics or different things because it is a bringing reason and nature together as opposed to one over the other one sidedness now one has to go through every single thinker of that and and think through that but it to me what you're talking about if i were to throw out a phrase now is making me think about the need for counter critique as it, you know what it's almost like you need a culture now of counter critique like counter enlightenment which is critique that is doing some of the functions that you are describing there um and because you're you're right there critique has to be put in the conversation but there's something where critique often gets captured in the dichotomy the back and forth like it's difficult for critique to get to this counter trend that i'm describing um and uh and then the questions would become why and and so on and so forth but let me give it to emilio and then mr ebert emilio i hope you're well if you're skipping your class you are a saint uh to do so to be here so good to see you sir hi actually because of the like the change of of um of our like i i my class is like push forward so uh, yeah it's yeah everything works out yeah so like for example for me it's like some some interesting um uh, things that i thought is like for example when when Javier was saying that if you if he read like Foucault in book he was going to uh, be judged like negatively for me it was like really interesting because like if if you read that like in in my class of someone like they would think like oh he's like really well read he's like a nice he's like a a good thinker like they wouldn't 
they wouldn't know about like the personal um thing with Foucault. Like you would just appear like a knowledgeable like person. So it's interesting, like depending on which like circle or which um place you, you see, like the, the misrepresent misrepresentation could be different, right? Like positive or negative, etc. So I think that's a an interesting thing. Um and for and it's interesting because for me, like misrepresentation, I, I don't I don't really mind if I'm being um if they represent me incorrectly, as as long as like the people that are close to me um, misrepresent me in like in a in a lesser capacity, right? Because like they will still misrepresent me, but if they have like a more accurate depiction of who I am, then I'm like then I'm I'm completely fine. I know because since I was a little, I did like I don't know like weird stuff, so people got like these like wrong ideas or like assumptions stuff. But like I didn't really mind because the people close to me like kind of had like a fuller picture, so that that was like enough for me. And and it's it's really interesting because sometimes even the closest people to you like don't like have this misrepresentation, and that's when it becomes like maybe like a lot more friction. <laughs> I remember being like very very little, like I, I was in the fourth grade or something, and normally I just like in at recess I used to read and stuff. Um, but suddenly I was like, no, I want to play soccer with like the other, the other, like with my other, my other classmates. And I had one friend that was also like, he didn't play soccer. He he just like stayed and and, and stuff. So he was like, I know you, you're not the type of person that uh, plays soccer, right? And I'm like, you don't know me. Like I'm now, I I want to become a person that plays soccer now, right? But like, like it, it was literally, like he literally said the words like, I know you, like I've known you like since like first grade, like I know who you are. And that, and that also like, that means when someone close to you misrepresents you, it's like it really creates a friction because like you, you actually don't know me that in that sense, in that moment, in that time. So that I think that's that's interesting. Um and regarding like critique and cheap critique and, and costly critique, I think like well done well 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 done critique, whatever whatever that means. Um by Dimitri. Um it's I think it's it's really useful, but for me, like I don't know, maybe it, this doesn't uh, fall into the realm um, of of philosophy. But for me, like critique is a really good place to start. But if it's it's the first step, right? But if the second step never arrives, it's almost pointless because I've heard like so many times like climate change and like we're global warming and stuff, and you're like, okay, you you've described the problem in several hundred different ways like i understand all the possible variations of the problem but give me one so one solution one proposal one proposition and and it could be like truth it doesn't have to be perfect but no one proposes like an alternative they always stay in the critique they critique something but they don't propose anything new and i'm, I'm sure that it, that's not always the case for thinkers and stuff but i also like i found it really frustrating that people spend like all this time doing the critique but then don't don't give anything new the, because that's it's almost as if you skipped the critique and just proposed something new that would be like more useful in in my in my view than just like being like a very extensive and thoughtful critique right but and and it's a f f important first step because if you don't have that sometimes you cannot propose something because you don't know what you should propose but that that lack of a second step always makes me really, I don't know, math. I don't know, but yeah, that, that was just some of the thoughts I, I had. <laughs> Beautiful, Amelia. I'll give it to Mr. Ebert. Um, it, I really like what you were saying about the contextual nature of determining if Foucault's bad or different things. Um, quickly, it makes me think, one, first off, uh, example of where we were talking about the dangers of critique, and now we're talking critiquing the critique of the dangers of critique, and there has to be this folding back on itself. That seems to be necessary. Right. Because it's really easy to go, oh, woke people, they don't have a point. No, they do have a point. Uh, the question is how to bring it into the counter critique. Right. How to if you grant me that phrase that I was using, that ability to turn it on itself. Also, it makes me think that there's some sort of tension between uh, creation and representation, 
which of course would be uh, delusion. Like if you undergo creation or you're creating or becoming new, well, the only reference point people have to represent you is how they knew you. And so they have to misrepresent you. But if you're not willing to face misrepresentation, you can't create and become something new, which makes me think of the conversation I had with Jacob, uh, where we're talking about a transformation in consciousness and then the temptation to just be isolationist because it's too painful to go back and undergo that misrepresentation. But the facing of the misrepresentation seems to be utterly critical for the transmate. There's something about that that seems really, really important, but let me pass it on. Yeah, cool. This reminds me of, uh, you know, I think actually one of the coolest thing, probably the, the coolest thing so far to me about uh, Greg Unreek's uh, Utah is his uh, proclamation, basically, that uh, language itself is the advent of propositions, which themselves in the positive, the sky is blue, the sea is wet, um, avail themselves to inherent, uh, inherently avail themselves uh, to critique. Um, because obviously if you present a positive, there is the possibility or potential of the negative of that positive or of that positive being insufficient, an insufficient, I would say, mischaracterization, right? So, so all characterizations are mischaracterizations, but one any given particular mischaracterization, like the sky is pink, um, avails itself to uh, 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 isn't. Let me read what I wrote here. The proposition is the superficial statement of inherent misrepresentation. So, a superficial statement of inherent misrepresentation. This is blue. Now, it's misrepresent. Is it actually blue? Who knows? Like what it really is. What is blue really? Uh, so it's a superficial misrepresentation. And so critique as such is the indeterminate gateway of infinite pathways of negativity away from this bottle is blue. So suddenly by presenting a single superficiality as a misrepresentation, now you are presented with an infinite potential of pathways away from that superficial uh, misrepresentation to uh, uh, each pathway, and those are those those pathways represent redefinitions. Uh, each pathway represents themselves an infinite potential of new misrepresentations, which you nonetheless may find more accurate or more satisfying or whatever. And I bring that up just to say that when we're presented with critique, so you know uh, this is a red ball, and there's something about me that does not assimilate that into my schematization, and somehow a critique arises, and I'm like, no, that's not just a red ball. Um, or someone's like, this red ball fits into this square peg, and something about me goes, no, that doesn't fit my schematization. I say no. And, um, and there's something about that process which redefines reality. If reality is this sort of total sum of meaning-making vis-a-vis language and symbology, there's something about critique which itself is participating in reality creation. And, um, and without which we would simply be stuck with these positive propositions without any reconsideration. Um, and, um, and yet the last thing I wanted to say is that pure critique, um, meaning only, resi only residing at that gateway of infinite pathways of negativity. So this could be that, or it could be that, or it could be this, or it could be that. Staying there is pure non-commitment. I would say it, it's actually not living. Um, and I think that that, I think one of my, you know, the next thing, my, my, the next issues I'll be championing is, um, is sort of against that, is, is, is the pathways, the pathway of commitment, the pathway of actually, to me, the real absolute knowing position is the one that can occupy the auto cannibalism without being completely attached to it at the simultaneously so you you occupy a position of full commitment you say no this is red you know what no i'm gonna blow myself up this is blue now that ability there to change from red to blue is a death uh, a death to your own meaning a death to your own identity as javier is mentioning and that ability is um is 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 what i think is sort of core to the cultivation of wisdom Wisdom is not knowing the right answer, but but understanding or or having facility with that sort of Bayesian uh, 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 process, with which apparently, according to predictive mind theory, is how the mind functions in the first place. Um, so 
yeah, anyway, I just wanted to bring up all of that. And then I really love what Chitan was saying regarding, you know, Lacan's, I don't know if it's Lacan, Lacan or he has a story about something, but the idea that, you know, there's two people that want to paint, uh, who's going to paint these grapes better? And uh, one guy goes to paint them and he paints them really accurately. And the other guy just paints a curtain. And that wins because uh, you can't actually know the grapes. And uh, the curtain is the... <laughs> The curtain is a better representation of what the grapes actually are. So anyway, I'll leave it there. I really like what you said. Absolutely, absolute knowing is the ability to occupy fully the space where auto cannibalism can occur and not be consumed. But you have to go into that space and there, that's where you're facing fear. Like if you don't do that, you're not facing death and you have to face death. That's absolutely the case. Uh, in the sense, the it, it's interesting in Hegel with the phrase true infinity because there's both the true infinity that's auto cannibalism, just like we talked about. And then there's like the true infinity of being in it without it devouring you and yet always at risk of the devouring. I wonder sometimes if there's a language that could be added there, a terminology that needs to be explored. Um, the other thing, I do like that part of Henry, Dr. Henrique's work where you know it's always the phrase the map isn't the territory where he's arguing the map is in the territory if there is a territory there's the ability to derive a map i think that's quite useful um which of course it, it would seem to what you were saying if i have a battery i can go this is a battery and that's just uh territory to territory that's an auto cannibalism right but then you can say this is not a battery and you're not bound by it but then you could have it's not a battery goes off auto cannibalism it's the ability to look at this experience it fully and say this doesn't have to be a battery and that seems to be the space where you're able to be like it's like this is a battery this is not a battery and then the final one something like this doesn't have to be a battery where there's some sort of linguistical balance that you're looking for that's very very difficult and that's the challenge and that's where you go yes i know the map isn't the territory and yet and yet uh, the map has something to do with the territory. There's something about it. And that's this difficult space where then you're saying this doesn't have to be a battery. So there's a critique there, but it's a critique that maintains that this is here. So you're looking for something of that nature. I like what you had to say. Let me give it to Jacob. And Mr. Fishman, good to see you today, sir. Good to see you as well. Yeah, things are going good. Good. I am glad. I still love your ceiling. It's freaking beautiful. Uh, it's Isn't really it? beautiful. It's so yeah. nice. And let me give it to Jacob and then Sam and Javier. Jacob, my friend. Yeah, welcome, Zach. Nice to meet you. Um, yeah. So, yeah, really appreciating the flow of this conversation and the dialectical, or paradoxical stance of commitment alongside readiness to completely surrender that as well or die into that that seems really important um yeah it strikes me as i've been like listening to this and then trying to like continually map it down from the critique of the philosopher to how does critique function in a human relationship and there's something about the necessity of uh authentically expressing the critique let's call it the critique you have an issue with somebody that you're very close with you have to authentically express that and it might be wrong but like the conversation cannot get started without you saying the thing you know with the with the full commitment of what it means to you but somehow like there's a holding open of it to something more and so this shift from monological critique to dialogical critique seems to be pretty essential to me um is the critique in the disposition of opening a conversation or not um and then so the the other piece i wanted to pull through i really like this question that michelle proposed of like uh effectively how does one counter um what what does zach stein call it a kind of conversation terminating cliches these kinds of mind virus functions that basically serve to uh set an authoritarian tone into a conversation space and dominate it and basically is what's happening in a lot of a lot of colleges the thing that comes to me is that um First, having a space where you're kind of autonomous of that and cultivating something more beautiful, uh, which I think, you know, is going on in the net and many other places. Um, but then from that, like, how do you actually get into that space of 
you're in the seminar room. Maybe Javier has a better idea of this. Um, yeah, in the seminar room and that actual situation is happening, wherein then, like, I, I feel like in that context, the passionate commitment with the dialogical openness, like somehow can you be more in the conflict than the other person that's in the critique whilst also being like with the openness at the same time is kind of what I'm feeling into. So wanted to put it out there and yeah, just the necessity of what you express somehow going beyond your control when you express authentically, you are, you kind of letting, letting things beyond your control. You rock, Jay, but I'll give it to Samantha. And we, uh, in Samantha and I, in OG, we're going to be in the Stygian, uh, Stygian collection that Pei and Holly is doing. Everyone go buy a copy. So we're looking forward to that. Pei, Pei also had a freaking hilarious video uh, yesterday on. It had Cadell's book and Trey and different people. Really freaking funny. So, Samantha, it's good to see you. Hi, good to see you guys, too. Um, some things that were brought up did make me think of how I'm taking a class right now uh, to get a certificate to teach English language arts for private school. And one of the portions of it, of the class, is learning how to conduct a classroom. And most of the test is multiple choice. And they they give you A, B, C, D, what would you do in this situation? And it's a very, and, and, and I am critiqued um, by the, the, the people putting together the test uh, by my answer of what I would do in this certain situation. Well, it's difficult. I, the English language portion of it is easier, but the how to conduct a classroom is actually a little more difficult because it's like there's no context there. And it's a very limited way of, um, of, of thinking. And it seems su like they're being superficial towards me because maybe in a certain context, a, a, a different a different thing should be done for a student than what they are asking on the question. And um, then it also made me think of uh, what's going on in, in, in school now and then the, the horrible things that have been going on in the last like week or so. Um, and they expect teachers to know, they expect teachers to um, teach their students in a certain way, know how to do things in a certain way, but obviously those ways are not are not working. Our students are falling behind, or our students are incredibly um, depressed and anxious. And um, we we especially in English, we we present these complex works of art um, to our students, and we expect them to understand and write an essay about them and understand these very complex emotions but we i noticed like even when i went to school 10 years ago uh or 10 15 years ago the teachers expected us to understand these um complex works and write an essay about it but they themselves would give us very very superficial answers so they were critiquing us in a very I don't know, superficial way, it felt like. And um, and it's funny because Javier was talking about uh, being misrepresented in your work. And it's funny because when I write poetry and people read my poetry, I always get, the, it's always a misinterpretation of what I meant. But that's not why I wrote the poetry. And that's not why these, um, these authors wrote these books. They wrote them to inspire thinking. So... In school, we we really need to um, change our, our ways of doing things. Like, and then somebody also was talking about giving a space for freedom of own thinking. I I don't want students to necessarily critique a work with, because they have to for a grade, because that's superficial in itself. It's for some outward gain. I want students to be able to light a fire within themselves and inspire new doors that open to ways of thinking that um, seem like they're past our limits. Um, maybe 
seem non-rational, um, but are the better answers. And um, I, I don't know, I've just been um, thinking about a lot about school and how we've been doing things because I'm just, I, I've been just in this, <laughs> taking this class right now. But um, basically, don't treat your students superficially. Don't critique their answers superficially. Don't treat students like a multiple choice quiz. And uh, th those are just my thoughts on what you guys were talking about. So. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. I really like that multiple choice point because now I'm thinking about um, the difference between multiple choice critique and surface honoring critique. Uh, because we were talking like there seems like instead of cheap, costly, maybe the language is something more of this kind of critique that's multiple choice as opposed to a critique that's surface honoring and therefore it's more dynamic and open, right? And it seems like we've been talking, there's a problem of surface thinking in terms of one-sidedness to use Hel Helganese, that's bad. But then there's depth thinking that's one-sided, that is problematic. So it seems to come back to this ability to hold them together, right? And that changes the quality of what they both are if they're held together, right? Like then suddenly um, surface becomes the realm of action as uh, Mr. Fishman and I have described. Um, and then depth becomes the way of informing action, facing fears, dealing with absolute knowing. So there's a change in the quality of what both surface and depth mean when they are put together in this manner. So, um, and the other thing I was going to say, if we didn't have the ability to look at the battery and say, you know, this is not a battery, like we were saying with Mr. Ebert, that it wouldn't be possible for Kafka to write the penal colony because he couldn't separate from the world of which then can the penal colony can be used to better understand um, having children in hospitals, right? So the extraction leads to an ability of effusing and helping you understand the world better. And then it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But with that ability comes risk. There's always risk, it seems, um, of getting lost in one or the other. You can have the banality of evil where it's just the, it's just the, just the, the battery relating to the pen. Then you have the um, spurious trouble of the idea just relating to the idea. How do you do both? And that seems to be what needs to be done. I will pass it to um, Javier. And I was also going to say, everyone, uh, so your, your work on Blue Raspberry is delightful and is your poetry. So I highly suggest it. And also, I really enjoyed your conversation with Brandon on teaching uh, literature and English. So I suggest that as well, because that was quite inspiring. But Javier, my good man. Uh, just a quick, <laughs> a quick uh, uh, response to Sam. Um, Sam, if I were you, I would... Uh... If I were to actually have, if I had students, and they were really young, and I'm like, I'm like, you want to critique this art? Draw, draw something, <laughs> draw what you got out of that art, um, and I would just leave it to them uh, about what that is. And and I and I say that because it seems like there, we seem to be hitting on on a couple of nerves about like what is critique, and I think Ebert's been hitting on it. Everybody's been hitting on it. It seems like. Martin Buber says something very interesting. The moment we create something, we take away possibilities. We actually have to sacrifice possibilities in order to create something. So even using language, um, the very fact that we assert something positive, we're already taking away possibilities within language. So that means that already there's this negativity that is there by virtue of this asserting. And so it feels like... And you know, you guys can correct me about what you think. It seems like critique kind of functions as like this of way of denying that comfortability of of of, assert, of assertion, maintaining the possibilities of freedom, right? And and I, I typically always hate these like trap dichotomies that people put me in when I'm like having daily conversations. Like, oh, well, are you this or are you that? It's like, no, I'm <laughs> I'm neither. <laughs> like, you know, it, and when when you say neither, they're like, what do you mean? And it's like, well, here's a chance for a new possibility. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I mean, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and yeah, I just, I feel like there has to be, there is a kind of dialectic because Kierkegaard does bring this up where it's like the dialectic between anxiety and comfortability. Because the moment the critique happens, there's something about the critique that all of a sudden becomes assimilated into a sameness, comfortability. Oh yeah, we've done the work already. That, that work is void. That's it. It's done. Um, and in that sense, they're actually avoiding anxiety just by that virtue of that uh, statement. Um, and so we have to continue to free ourselves from comfortability, but then also have this temperance of anxiety as well. We have to temper our anxiety. Um, we have to think about managing that also 
But it seems like between the space of anxiety and comfortability, you find possibility and freedom. Um, and of course, freedom and freedom is like death. <laughs> in this case, <laughs> it looks like death and misrepresentation. Um, but yeah, that's my comments. Outstanding. I'll pass it to Cheetah and Mr. Fishman and Alexander. So what you need to do is you say, I'm neither, but with a slash through it. There's a slash through the neither. That's what's going on. And I wonder if what we're talking about is some kind of critique with the slash through it. Like being for Derrida, where Heidegger wrote being and put a slash through it. Is there some way in which the critique we're talking about is critique with a slash through it? Which then, again, it makes me think of the difference between reformation and revolution. Because a revolution is funny. It overturns. But what is a revolution? It goes in a circle, right? You get back to where you started. But a reformation, like it seems like the difference we were talking about, the, the ism and the postism is stuck here. That seems to be the revolution place where you actually ironically go in a circle. Whereas the counter seems to be the realm of actually going in a different direction or actually getting stuck from the revolution as circle. Maybe there's something there. Um, also, I just wanted to note quickly, David Hume was adamant that philosophical critique had to be in the form of literature because when philosophy had to be in the form of literature, it had to be in a sense m story like we have to be embodied. If it's m story the likelihood that it is actual and relating to reality is much higher. And he was concerned. He was particularly concerned as the state of literature as a litmus test for the health of the society, because it tended to be an indication that thought was separated from life or life was separated from thought based on the state of literature. And of course that applied to the arts in general. He was fascinating on that, but Chitan. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, Samantha's point was brilliant in that sense of so bringing a language classroom into it was I myself experienced it in my classroom when I teach. And I'm also language teacher, you know, in part in that sense. So uh, the point actually is that when you critique a text of a student, and she's absolutely right, there, there, is, there is a certain kind of violence involved in that movement. The challenge is that, that once that violence is being done, you know, once that act is being done, then how does the student respond? Does he have any other language than critique to respond to it? What would you tell a student that he, he has to engage critically with the with, with what, the, what the teacher is saying? There's no other language left to us in that sense. And the, this problem is extremely interesting, and in that you can go back to Ebert's very brilliant point about negativity over there. You know that 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 there, 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 there's this challenge of covering the negativity and engaging with the negativity in that sense. You know, uh, of of a certain uh, point in that in, in that manner. I, there's a very brilliant book by uh, uh, Agamben, George Agamben, in that sense called State of Exception where he's sort of trying to bring out this point that in the in our very ability to posit a law, there is always an exception involved into it. You know? And finally, for him, any kind of law can actually function for its own exception. There's nothing stopping a system of laws to function from their own exception. That means you cannot have any coherent system of laws which cannot be functioning from outside themselves in that, in the, in, in that sense. And finally, his solution to that problem, in, you know, coming from Walter Benjamin was that we need to be able to play with laws, like a children play with toys in that sense. You know, uh, that's where, that's where, and he had a very brilliant point from Benjamin Torah, and, you know, without getting into it. But but this point of Agamemnon actually goes back to the, the discussion between all and not all in Lacan. And I think that's where Ebert's point becomes extremely important, where, where this question of all and not all in Lacan is that, you know, that if you have a set which is universal, which can be universalized, it would always have an exception. And I don't want to bring in my masculine feminine over here immediately right now, because for, for the point that these terms becomes very, you know, um, they already have meaning in the people you know, in their heads. But the idea being that a set can be universalized, then it can always have an exception. And the only way for a set not to have an exception is that it cannot be universalized. It has to be, it has to be you know, looked at in its own very particular uh, shape, which is which is a non-all position in that sense. And minute you start thinking of modernity as as you know uh, this this touching of society through these sets of all in that sense, where where this there this possibility of games which can be played through non-alls, where where rules are something which which are not given to you in advance, where rules are something which have to be universalized each at each moment would always necessarily mean that there would be exception to, the, to, to those rules. And those rules without actually breaking any law. That is what Nazism and fascism was. Fascism is not a threat in that sense that you change the law or the constitution. Fascism is a threat that, that a state can become completely lawless while following all the laws. 
that's that's that can only happen in modernity that cannot have happened before any time before because it is it is it is not a simply breaking of the law it is a form of functioning of the law which is where law itself is suspended but the force of law is still present law comes up with its full force without it with it having any content in it which is what you see in classrooms also in that sense that where where the law itself is functioning in full force but it has no content left it is empty of any meaningful exchange with the student you know it's it's mere, merely a form of violence of force which is you know student encountered in that sense so given this point that 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 and when a law is imposed upon you 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 are always bound to be subjected to its exception in that sense and once that has happening the only language that you have to open the negativity space back again to to not let the, hide the negativity no do not let hide the contradiction of universal in that sense is that you you have to find the language back which is a language of intimacy which is a language of particularity which is which is a game in which rules cannot be freely given to you and inevitably that language goes through some in some form of um, uh language of critique in that sense you know frankfurt school down to foucault whatever language you want to find from there that whole lacan that that, that whole you know critic what do what do you make call critical theory today you sometimes you also call anti philosophy in that sense you know <laughs> um, these are all words that we have for <laughs> but you have to find that language in our times in some of these schools in, in that sense which is why you have to read hegel alongside lacan in, in today in, in that sense you know <laughs> Magnificent, Chetan. I'll pass it to Mr. Fishman. Um. So now I'm thinking, does it all come down to the response of critique, maybe, or something? So, for example, Javier is skipping class after the professor did what they want. So that's his response to critique. Is that like the response? Um. It it also makes me think. One, obviously, Nietzsche's child on the universalizing every moment and the play in that makes me think of finite infinite games by John Cars. Also, Mr. Snyder's book on Black Earth on stateless zones and fascism is quite good, and he has um, Mr. Mr. Snyder. I also would know, it kind of reminds me what you're saying there about critique as play, where you have to every moment take the particular as a universal. It's kind of like what happens in these conversations where somebody introduces a language and you have to play with that language and treat that language as now that's the language we're using, and like seriously universalize that language and then someone introduces a new language you drop the other one and now you're playing with the new language and you have to be doing that every second and there's a kind of meta analysis of what happens in these net discussions that for me kind of embodies what you're describing because you have this problem where every like we're talk we there's so often we talk about language right because every philosopher has their own language and different terminologies that means different things and in order to have these inter philosophical discussions because now I'm thinking inter religious discussions you know they talk about like to have these inter philosophical discussions there has to be this ability to play with what other language is introduced hold it like the universal but just as soon as somebody introduces a new language let it go and grab that one then let it go and grab them and try to gather them together and maybe that's the quality of the critique we're looking for maybe at the end of the day that's the new quality of critique is that meta language ability or whatever that is where you're say let's use that language because the moment you say that language doesn't work or it falls out that's a kind of critique right you're saying it it doesn't work but it's a critique from the creative act of the conversation itself so i'm wondering if the structure of these kind of discussions itself points to what this new quality of critique is we're talking about in the act of holding a language releasing a language holding a language releasing a language bringing some terms from that other language to this one all of that suggests some sort of counter critique structure in my mind but let me give it to mr fishman mr fishman i hope you're doing well sir I'm doing well. Yeah, so this is a really interesting conversation and uh I'm thinking about what Javier said about how like critique can serve as a defense against the the certainty of of uh assertion, right? But then also like to make a critique, you have to make an assertion, right? And so like there's this weird tension and kind of what what Jacob was saying as well about how like in order to have a conversation, you have to take a position, right? But um so like, what is, what is the difference between taking a position which fixes you into a sort of dogmatic certainty and taking a position which uh, allows you the opportunity to engage in a dialectic, right? And so um, I, think, I think it does come down to simply like the mentality of the people involved, right? It's like, are you, do, uh, it's like, it's, it's, it's such a strange thing because like I'm saying, you have to take a position but, and if you don't, like, if you say, you know, Javier, you're saying like, 
you know, I don't want to take this or that position. I want to take neither, but that itself is a position, right? Like to, because you're, you're in, you can either take a position or not, and you're choosing not to, and that is a position, right? And you're, you're fixing yourself to that. And so like, there's no, there's no getting out of that. But at the same time, there is a certain like personal, emotional openness that is required in order to, to engage in a dialectic. Right. And, um, like it's got me thinking about the way that like Judaism really embraces the argument, right? And this is this is a, a result of the hierarchical structure or lack of hierarchical structure in rabbinic Judaism, right? Like in the church, like they, the Catholics have a position for any given question, right? If you ask a Catholic priest a question, he'll give you the Catholic answer. If you ask a rabbi a question, he'll give you the Jewish argument. Right. And because like there's no there's no hierarchy. You know, I mean, in the Catholic Church, if two priests disagree with each other, the bishop will step in and settle the argument. And both those priests have to align themselves with what the bishop says. Right. And if the two bishops disagree, then it's the archbishop up to the pope. Right. And whatever the pope says goes. But in Judaism, there a rabbi is a rabbi is a rabbi. Right. So if this rabbi says A and the other rabbi says B, that argument just remains for the next thousand years, right? And it gets rehashed over and over again. But there is no settling that. Or there's no higher, there's no arch rabbi to settle that argument, right? And so we just have the Jewish argument and it's taught that way and it's embraced that way, right? In the yeshivas, like they'll, they'll teach a lesson and then they'll pit two students against each other and they'll say, okay, now argue about it, right? Um, and so I think to me, the whole key is just like embracing it, it's you have to have a willingness to take a stand and like really firmly be like, this is my position. Right. Because when the rabbis argue with each other, like they really they are they get in each other's face. They start yelling and like it's this very like intense thing and they really care about their position. But they also recognize that the nature of Judaism is not to settle the argument ultimately for all time. The nature of Judaism is to rehash the argument throughout the generations right and that's that's my position so that's all i gotta say interesting there where it's almost <laughs> as if the rabbis are still arguing about it then that's evidence there's gold there whereas if the rabbis it's kind of funny like if it's a obviously topics came up that the rabbis stopped talking about it's almost like if they stop talking about it, that's evidence, reason to think there's not gold there. And yet if they keep arguing about it, that's reason to think there's gold there. And yet, ironically, if they're arguing about it, it makes it seem like there's no agreement there. But there's agreement that this is worth arguing about. And so in the critique is actually an overlay of thinking that there's reason to consider this in the same way that if people are using different languages and then suddenly people are using lack, lack or X, you know, you, it just keeps coming up like the reoccurrence of certain terms. The fact that they keep uh, reoccurring would be evidence that there is probably something there that is not elsewhere. And so there's something about I'm wondering if the new quality of critique is tied to this discussion as we're putting it. Um, and I, I really like what you were saying with the with the, with uh, the rabbi versus Catholicism. That's very interesting. Mr. Ebert. A couple of just random points here. Um, uh, OK, so one. One point that I, I think is is important and sort of contradictory uh, is that. Neutrality, our relationship to the object of critique is non-neutral, but the state of critique as critique um, is sort of like a uh, non-positional, unless you take the, like, for instance, me simply saying this is, this is not a battery or this is not merely a battery. I'm not taking a position. What I'm doing is keeping my position open. Um, so I can effectuate a position out of one of the myriad, indeed probably infinite potentials from deploying critique. So critique is sort of this gateway to re-infinitize uh, the potential of an object. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's important. So like Javier's point, I experience this all the time. Oh, so you're a musician. I, I used to like, you're a musician. Uh, no, I'm so much more. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know why I'm so much more than that. And, um, you know, so like you as a being very often don't want to accept one of these finite qualities, unless you're in one of those moments where you're like, um, I was, I was telling Peter 
Lindbergh this. I was like, see, you don't, you don't want to be like, even if it was someone being like, oh, the handsome guy with the beard, you would be like, no. And he's like, actually, I would really love that. Um, so there are moments when you want to accept a determinate position from someone if that's something you don't like you feel is other to you, typically. But if you've been the handsome guy with a beard all your life, or you've been the pretty girl all your life, then of course you're gonna be like, I'm so much more than a pretty girl. No, 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 no. So there's this desire within ourselves and our relationship to others to, to have this sort of um, keeping a, a, a one foot out for some of us. Some of us really want like, no, I'm a Christian blah, 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 um, or whatever the case is. I don't know, I have a totally foreign concept to me. Um, then then but but our relationship to these things is non-neutral literally no such thing as neutrality it goes back to our conversation on uh, politics and the impossibility of being non-political in terms of like actual expression um and again just want to re-emphasize this idea that language itself i i think i agree with Enrique is like i'm trying to think of a sentence that isn't uh doesn't avail itself to critique so for instance i don't feel well what do you mean you don't feel well? Why don't you feel well? How, how come you don't feel well? Are you sure you don't feel well? Like, maybe it's just this. There's all sorts of uh, problems with just about anything. I say, I'm hungry. Uh, I'm going to walk over there. Are you really going to walk over there? Who's walking? You? Like, you could just really go nuts and go to town with this uh, notion of critique. Um, there's a relationship, I think, between overextension of critique. So, for instance, you're teaching your students, you're like, how do we critique things? Well, if you're not like careful you could instill this sort of apophenic apophenic uh where, where you see too many connections between things but anyway where you're like a conspiratorial mind where everything is is not what it seems and like yeah because that's essentially what critique is right it's like no this isn't just that this here's a great story class it's not a great story here's why so it's like all about this isn't the thing that it says it is and um and if we you know if we cultivate that a lot obviously we end up in conspiracy land uh apophenia even you know schizophrenia um manic depression uh, or mania rather um so anyway what i wanted to add to that con that conversation about how to teach kids or anybody about critique my sense is that you want to draw attention to the internal limitations so that critiques naturally arise so that what we're drawing our attention to is the existence of limits that are yet to be discovered that will be naturally activated in the presence of something that we don't feel is what it says it is um, and so we say no this is this isn't just a battery and i suddenly feel that it's not just a battery but if i approach every goddamn battery as this could also not be a battery that's a luxury that uh is like a sort of philosophical luxury, but it's not necessarily utilitarian like uh, necessity. Um, so the extent to which it benefits me to constantly go around consciously reminding myself that nothing is what it seems and it can all be something else remains to be seen if that's part of the process I'm in in my life and it needs to be that way. But I wouldn't say that, that that's necessarily ideal. It comes back to the conversation about being in love. Shut the fuck up! Being in love, right? So it's like, uh, how am I going to really be fully in love with someone? How do I get to experience being in love if I'm constantly going to be like, this person may not be the thing. This person's also someone else's fuck buddy. This could just be a random thing. How am I going to fully experience the committal? Now, why would I not experience that committal? My only answer is that the only reason people don't do that is because they're fucking scared of getting their heart broken because they had it broken. They're like, you know what? Fuck that. I'm going to enter every relationship knowing this could also end. And I'm conscious like, no, this could end at any time. It's totally fine. And it... But what extent do we want to be living in a sort of uh, uh, pre-acclimated failure? That's also sort of a, an obviation of the necessity of courage. So I keep thinking the thing to really understand is the limits. Things actually just work well. If we pay attention, I can be like, this is a battery until all of a sudden I need a thing to lift up my keyboard. I'm like, oh, the battery works for that. And you let necessity determine because you run up against limitation. You don't have anything else to use. And you're like, oh, the battery works for it. So you pay attention to limitation, pay attention to necessity and allow things to work as they as they should. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, that's my thoughts on it.
That was magnificent. And um, you gave us a wonderful example of love and the ability to scream at someone to shut up and they'll still be there for dinner. And actually, it does seriously make me think about how me and my brothers, all we do is treat each other like sarcastic a-holes. And that playing with the boundary is actually strong evidence of a strong bond. Like people you can't be a sarcastic a-hole with actually is evidence it's not a strong relationship. And it's funny how you'll see this all the time where people who like treat each other like crap actually would like go to the foxhole with one another. Whereas people that are always nice to one another don't go to the foxhole with one another. So right there, there's something very interesting. Now, obviously that there's exceptions. I don't think to be- I that that was my, that that was my dog. So <laughs> <laughs> that means you really love them if you can call them a dog. Call me a dog again. Uh, <laughs> If I did that with the other person in the room, uh, dinner might be weird. But yeah, no, it's that boundary play. But I have lots of work on in my relationship with my uh, partner. It of course depends. I would not say you know the sarcastic a wholeness is not the quality of my relationship with my mother, even if it is with my brother. So one has to condition these things uh, and be quite careful. But there's something to what you were saying with Henriquez and how everything can have the counter. Um, again, if I if I bring that to David Hume, that was exactly the concern: is that everything does entail its critique. So if all thinking is is critique, then you'll deconstruct everything. To use your language, I mean, David, like so much of it is like. Basically, playing with infinity is to find limits, of which then upon finding, you can sublate them. That's what learning is, is looking for the limits. And we and the problem is it's not self-evident what the limits are, so we have to do this groping in the dark, per se. We have to be looking and figure and find it, and then when we find it, then we can negate sublate. But that's critical because that would mean the role of critique is in service of the finding of limits, for the sake of negating, sublating them. And that seems to be the new quality of critique that we're pointing at, which I think this language test I'm playing with gets at, because you're fine, what's the limit of this language? Okay, it doesn't work, we need to move on from Deleuze or Hegel or whatever, because it doesn't, and you're looking for the limits to bring it. And I know Javier has said before, you think Buber until Buber fails, right? That's what you're supposed to do with a thinker. You really think them until they break. And there's, I think learning is about finding limits because the limit then is the in invitation and to the unlimited, uh, which is the invitation into a new limit, into a new one, and it keeps going and going. That seems to be getting at what's so important here in the playing with boundaries. And that's also relationships, right? The very fact you could be a sarcastic a-hole with your brother plays with the boundary to confirm the relationship. And if you don't play with the boundary, you never confirm the relationship. So you're nervous about the relationship. You don't know what the rules are. Uh, you don't know what you can do and what you can't do. And then I'll pass it to Chichan. All of the language of belonging, again, is givens and releases. Society has to have givens to function, but if all it has is givens, it's oppressed, but then if all it has is releases, it doesn't know the rules, because it's never, so it's always kind of so, sociologically you have breakdown. And then for David Hume, there's a spread of the quote unquote philosophical melancholia that you can't escape from. No, everyone, those are terminologies from a presentation the other day, but it seems like thinking has so much to do with a finding of limits. Um, to use your language, which I think is extremely helpful. And again, the very fact that that language keeps coming back up would be evidence of the effectiveness of that language because it is going through a kind of critique in conversations to see what language keeps coming back up. And if the language of limits keeps coming back up, there would be reason to think that this is good language. And that's the critique. The critique is indirect in a way when you have these conversations, right? No one in this conversation is, let's critique, uh, let's critique David Hume, let's critique Hegel. What happens is you have a conversation about a topic and indirectly you see what thinkers and what language comes back up and what doesn't, and that then functions as the test. Uh, and then you go from there and the very fact that another thinker doesn't keep coming back up is evidence of the limit of that thinker, and then you have to keep Think, and then you keep talking Hegel until you find the, you can't find the limits of Hegel unless you keep talking about Hegel, right? And the fact that he keeps coming back up means you haven't found the limit yet, right? If he keeps coming back up, you haven't found the limit yet. And then you keep going until you find the limit and then you, what, and then you go to Marion or something. So there's something about the structure of conversation that has this quality of critique. And maybe we can say that the net is trying to catch the thing, right? What, what doesn't fall through the net per se? You know, what stays into the, what stays in the net until it falls through the net, right? You know, what keeps going in different things? So I, I like the comment. Let me pass it to Chitan and then Samantha. You know, uh, Gamin has a very interesting sort of a formulation for this kind of a discussion we are having, and especially Daniel's point, where he's sort of discussing that that there is one is this inductive logic and deductive logic. You, know, you go from particular to particular, to general, general to the particular in that sense, you know. 
and uh, he's saying that there is another kind of movement possible, a movement which works from particular to particular. You know, where where something is not moving from general to particular first, but is moving from particular to particular. A good example of it can be the paradigmatic shift that uh, that uh, paradigm shift that 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 um, Kuhn talks about. You know, the, the question of paradigms in that sense, where a one paradigm shifts into another paradigm, and that movement is not because one paradigm is proven wrong, so another movement, is, that is not the case. The paradig paradigmatic shifts normally occur because of the movement from one particular world to another particular world. You know, where it's not necessary the next particular world is perfect and the other, other one is proven wrong, that's not the point in that sense. The point is that that, that, that movement involves something. It's something like, you know, uh, Jack sort of gives an example that when, when children play games, so there are there are certain kinds of games for which the rules are pre-given. You may call them finite games also in today's times. You know, where the rules are pre-given, where you're playing to win and so on and so forth. But with kids, even, even with animals, you can play a certain kind of game where rules are infinite. Where you can create a rule each time you engage with it. Each time you can create a new rule. And, and there is no winning and losing also. You can just keep on playing. You know, you can you can see many times with animals, with children, you can play that those kind of games in that sense. Um, those games involve the shifting from one rule to, 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 to the other rule, and each rule shift involves the whole universal shift. You know, which are not necessarily fair, but you accept it. You accept it as part of the uh, way you played in that in that in that sense. Um, if you think about this problem, I think I don't completely agree with the government, but if you think about what Ebert was saying before. Um, that this question of desire in that sense, um, you know, uh, and you take it, uh, Lacan has an interesting formulation for this. Lacan's formulation is that the gap itself is engaged in two ways. One is, as I said, the all, the other is the non, although one is when you know who you are, but that knowledge itself involves a gap, you know. The other is you know you are not what you think you are, in that sense. You know, the other side is you know you are not that. And the problem is that there you have to create a facade. Both have its own. The one is what you call an obsessional structure. The other is a hysteric structure in, 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 in the Lacanian thinking. They are both, both, both forms of neurotic psychic state in that sense. You know, they are both failures of question. But they both, the uh, 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 neurotic, say, obsessional neurotic, neurotic would know who he is. And that is his symptom. It's not that he doesn't know who he is. It's not like he's lying or he, 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 his knowledge is false. That's not the point. Point is, in, in this very certainty itself, Lies the symptom. And that is why neurotics always truth is always the real truth. It's not that his truth is false in that sense. He believes in his truth completely, and you know. But the hysteric truth is a truth which is where the hysteric himself knows that uh, herself knows that it's not what what the truth itself is not important. What is important is the the very extreme sense of gap that I'm experiencing and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, because women is always in a sense creating that facade for you know. And man is always sure of who he is. He has a goal. He has an aim. He, you know, uh, so these two structures are two ways of engaging with that gap. That gap always is, in some senses, you know, engage within these two two ways fundamentally. And critique always involves, in that sense, or emerges on the side of the obsessional structure. Critique as a symptom. Critique as a, as a as a as a process in sort of emerges on the side of the you know, uh, for some reason. And both have their own contradictions. No, none of them is perfect ways of dealing with, <laughs> there's no perfect way to deal with that gap in that sense. Both have their own contradictions. But critique always emerges on the other side. And that, which is why it's not it's not easy to simply put critique on the other side and think it will solve the problem because that will simply change the structure. And that, that won't solve the, <laughs> you know, <laughs> question, yeah. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. I'll pass it to Samantha and I'll have to go in a little bit. Um, but, you know, any final statements, please. I've enjoyed this immensely. To your point, um, Chitan, it makes me think that if there were no determinations, there would be no critique, right? Like in Hegel, if there were no determinations, there'd be no critique. But if there were no determinations, there would be nothing. Uh, so there has to be determinations. But then that, it's almost like the existence of critique itself is a limit. Like it, that, the very existence of critique is a limit that then... The nature of reality is of determinations of which necessitates the existence of critique, which is the possibility of excess of those limits. And so critique is the meta result of determinations that then make possible excess. And that's why limit and excess are always so tied together or limited lack in different things. So the very fact we 
face critique uh, determinations, like the bookshelf, beginning of the philosophy of the right, then lead to the possibility of the critique of those bookshelves or the systems, that if there was no possibility of critique, there would be nothing, but the possibility of critique is the possibility of freedom from the determinations, which then, of course, runs the risk of getting rid of the determinations of which make possible the critique, <laughs> and thus the freedom. So there's this back and forth that is going, right? Um, I, I love that. That was a very lovely comment. But let me pass it to Miss uh, Miss Great Miss Samantha, and then to Alexander Ebert. Um, all this talk about limitations makes me think of an example. Of, I, I was trying to um, think about and how. Sorry, my my dog's just whining <laughs> in the background. Um, it makes me think of um, maybe how we should th shift our thinking. Um, in, in teaching, <laughs> sorry, I keep laughing, <laughs> it's just, um, so say I wanted to uh, may, or have my students read The Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka. And instead of uh, doing what has always been done in, in middle school and high school, how it was done for me, instead of saying the synopsis, this is what the story is about, these are the main characters, very, very surface level things. I pose a question like, well, I want you to think about what would you do and who would you turn to if you woke up one morning and you realized you couldn't take care of yourself anymore for the rest of your life? And I would, I would pose limits. I would say, you can't use your parents and you can't use your best friend. And so I keep putting on limits to their thinking, so they have to keep expanding their thinking. Well, who would I turn to? If 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 I can't if I can't turn to my parents, and I can't turn to my best friends, and I can't turn to the neighbor across the street, what would I do? And I I, I direct um, the conversation that way. Uh, I direct it that way. Um, if I'm trying to teach a specific emotion or a specific very complex issue that I want um, students to work through. Now if I wanted them to work through another issue, I could pose another question for the same story. And I could say something like, how, how important would it be to get back to how you were? And is it possible to get back to how you were? And then I put limitations on that. And so that's just my idea of maybe that's how we can shift our thinking in school is asking questions and putting limitations on their answers so they have to think of new ways of thinking. So. Javier, you need to get in Sam's class. That's where you need to be. You're just in the wrong class. That's why you have all this problem. So that's freaking brilliant because right there, the problem with the synopsis is there's no encounter with limit. Oh, we got the whole story. This is what the story is about. But what you, the moment you say, well, what would you do? And here's the limit. Oh, you can't go to your friend. Suddenly now they're thinking. The introduction, now you're thinking. And that's what's so wild. Again, um, Mr. Eber and I would describe it. Limits aren't what they, limits aren't what we think they are. Like the word limits doesn't mean what we think it means because the introduction of it opens. Like there's, it's like limits are keys. Like there's an opening that occurs with limits. There's some open, it's, it's wild. I, so yeah, Javier, you need, to, you need to go to Sam's class, but Mr. Ebert. Oh, there we are. Um, I think this is great. And I wanted to just try and put a cap on this for myself. Um, all right, so to summarize, <laughs> to summarize uh, Chitan's uh, comment, everyone's comments uh, and, and bring this back to limits and Hegel and everything. So phase shifts are, are a product of limits. Uh, you know, uh, the threshold uh, at which water boils is a limit. And then you have steam and, uh, and it collects up in uh, the fucking air and cloud bursts occur at a limit of saturation of those uh, air particles. And then it rains and so on and so forth. All of these phase shifts are occur through these saturation uh, quantitative thresholds, these limits, and then those limits produce the next sort of wave. Um, and, and that just occurs everywhere. So, but to take that a step further, 
that moment at which the limit occurs or the limit is discovered vis-a-vis -vis the, the excess quantitative action, that moment is, des is described in Hegel and definitely described by me in freak theory. And, I, and, and, and that's why I love visualizing it through the waveforms. That moment at which all of that saturation occurs within a given limit is a pure saturation of infinite self-relation of everything within the limit congested uh, and saturated unto itself. And because it experiences itself as fully saturated, it experiences itself as fully indeterminate. So in the moment of the zone or whatever the case is that we can like bring it back to human experience. But I bring that up to say that so far in my study of math, I'm convinced that the only actual true infinities occur vis-a-vis -vis limitation. So when you see, uh, you know, a sine one over x, and you see the waveform going, and then the side of the little, and it goes, and it produces an infinity vis-a-vis um, -vis limitation as it approaches zero. The the only true indeterminacies are these full-blown compression, con condensed, collapsed, full you know, indeterminate interrelations, because anything other than that is a countable linear infinity, which is in Hegel's term, a, a spurious infinity, because it just keeps going and it doesn't have a limit on it. And so it's not actually infinity. That's Hegel's whole point with the infinity thing is the only true infinities have limits. They're only created by limits. I think mathematics bears that out. So if we take this whole thing to the concept of critique, uh, and, uh, and, and, and the proposition and then the critique, um, we have like this, this interesting dichotomy between a, a limitation around the, the object, like this thing is this, and that's the limitation of it. And we experience it. It's almost like we, if, if we get to a place of critique with the object, we're experiencing its limit. And, uh, and, and our very interaction with it sort of explodes it beyond its limit and transforms it into the next thing. So we create the phase shift vis-a-vis -vis our own limitations with that object, like our own, almost like our own either boredom with it or, or, or uh, we become annoyed with the object or we're, it's unsatisfying in some way. And our limitations vis-a-vis -vis interacting with that limited uh, prescribed uh, proposition around that object, like this is a battery, produces the next um, the next moment. But what's interesting and what I'm trying to bring up here and connect it to critique is that that moment of critique within which we become uh, dissatisfied with the prescribed proposition of that of that object. We've been talking about critique as this or I've been talking about it, at least as this moment of sort of infinitized um, possibility, where suddenly it's not just a battery, and by saying it's not just a battery, I reopen the landscape into these sort of infinite possibilities of negativity. I haven't yet choose, chosen a path, but in that moment, we've re-prescribed infinity into that thing vis-a-vis -vis the limit again. So the limit produces, reproduces the moment of infinity through this negation of the thing as itself and the prescribed thing. And we, and so that's why I'm thinking this critique, this moment of critique, not the path that you choose after critique, but critique in and of itself is sort of this moment of the sublated, condensed, infinitized uh, uh, limit. And we're reaching our own threshold with this object. And the moment we reach it, it suddenly can be anything. And then right after that, we choose a path. But but at that moment, it bears a lot of resemblance to this uh, to mathematics and the way mathematics define uh, uh, develops uh, infinity, and the way Hegel develops infinity, and the way Enrique described to me uh, the other day about how the proposition entails this infinite he almost just i think he said verbatim infinite pathways to other uh to other definitions or whatever the case is so that moment of infinity vis-a-vis -vis critique uh is really interesting and has bears a lot of similarities to everything else we're talking about and it happens through limitation the limitation that we encounter with it uh, and that each subject will encounter differently someone else will be like no it's a red ball it works perfectly with my schematization i don't have any limitation with that red ball because they haven't discovered their own necessity or their own limit with that red ball as red ball. But someone else would be like, no, I'm fucking sick of that red ball as red ball. I have this other use for it or whatever the case is. So anyway, just want to tie that all together. Magnificent, Mr. Ebert. Anyone else? <laughs>
because we have to impose a limit so we can unlock the unlimitedness. Anyone else this evening, this uh, afternoon? Uh, just quickly to just think Please. along the I'll just, you know, uh, it's a very interesting uh, problem actually to, to think, you know, good infinity and bad infinity in, in, alongside this question of movement from particular to particular, you know, rules that can, can be. Um, and we know that this, that this this movement which involves a shift in paradigm is a movement which actually encounters its own limit immediately in that sense. It's not immediately in that sense that you no, know, it is a movement which is not possible without a particular discourse reaching reaching its own limit. And by limit, I don't just mean external limits, whether it's true in the world or not. By limit, I mean a limit that is that is reached by the engagement with its own incompleteness or its own contradiction, which is how the next one seems, you know, uh, better to us and so on and so forth. And if he, and in, in Fagan is an interesting problem here that, that for him, um, infinity is infinity when it's sort of comprised of finiteness. In it, in it, it's made determinate when it's comprised of finiteness in that sense. And uh, Ebert's thinking is interesting that, that criticality becomes that moment or that point at which uh, uh, other modes of finiteness sort of opens up for us, I think. That's what he's trying to, you know, uh, if I'm not wrong. I'm trying to think alongside him that that you know other modes of finiteness in that sense open up uh, uh, for that infinity. The interesting thing about uh, about this this problem of limits in my head here is that limits themselves becomes an interesting sort of uh, a point here because critique doesn't emerge with say any limit. If if the limit is internal, one can actually find other modes of thinking than limit. Critique becomes an interesting thing when the limit itself is imposed upon the infinity from certain, um, you know, position of authority, certain position of uh, um, external position in that sense, uh, where, the, where the limits themselves are in, in, in many ways previously put are spurious limits in that sense. They are bad, bad limits in that sense. And there's something interesting happening at that, at that point where a, a thing has to be freed from its own limits to be able to find its own limits in that, in that, in that sense. That, that to find its own real limit, it has to be first freed from its limits. You know, it's not that the thing, thing's own limits are not ever immediately visible to us. So for instance, in mathematics, you can take many functions uh, which would never reach their own limit because they can they will immediately find their practical application unless you allow them the whole space of the mathematical language and then you will realize at what point that function fails you know uh, in in some senses uh, i just you know. beautiful uh chitan i wonder it makes me think you know walter benjamin had that funny thing where he was like there's no shapes just colors I was like, what? Like, it's just all you ever see is one color going into another color, right? Is it something like that, maybe? Where it's not limit, it's just one color ending where another one ends, which in a way is limit and yet not limit, right? It, there's a way in, you know, what Mr. Ebert is saying, it's limits all the way down, but also all the way up. And up just keeps going. <laughs> so there's some funny way where the word limit doesn't mean what we think it means, right? And maybe it's something where it's like Walter Benjamin describing colors, where all we ever see is colors going into other colors and that shapes is an imposed limits, but the shapes are more virtual, really. Now, of course, Walter Benjamin is quite funny on that, but in the same way is limit simply the possibility of shape of a bunch of colors going into one another. But there is still a kind of limit in colors bleeding into other colors because blue becomes red. But the limit is a becoming then. See, that's the thing. Like, if it's all colors, when blue becomes red over there, it's not that the blue is limited where the red begins. The blue becomes the red would be kind of the model there. So that would get into where all limits are becoming with the BE in parentheses. Uh, and so there's some, like I, we've with, so there's something very interesting there, and I like that very much. Um, the things also it makes me think. Um, it's quite funny because if we do a meta-analysis of, say, the net conversation, uh, Javier had an equilibrium. He was going to school and he was all great, like we're using freak theory. And then the professor was like, freaking Foucault is a pedophile. Destabilization, waves everywhere, comes to the net. And it's precisely the waves that then make possible the conversation that leads to a new equilibrium of a new understanding of a quality of, a quality of critique. Right. And so the very nature, if 
in that way is this new quality of critique, the way, the very waves that Mr. Ebert is describing, of which is the discussion of quote unquote the net, of which is the going into that destabilization to bring a new equilibrium. So that then next week you can have another explosion and then do it again and do it again. And here's the thing. If every week we just kept talking about Javier's teacher experience, because we, you know, it, it would get boring, right? The waves would just do this. There'd never be an equilibrium. People would be like, oh my gosh, it's freaking September. And we're still talking about the Javier's teacher. That would suck, right? So if the wave never gets a new equilibrium, then the wave disperses and dies, right? So it's, it's important that these philosophical conversations have some sense of, you, you start with an equilibrium, the philosophy begins because of the explosion of the waves, and then you have to work to a new equilibrium, which if you don't, it dies, right? And so there's always this movement that is occurring. And if we use freak theory, there's something about that that's, the, the, problem, the problem would therefore be critique that keeps equilibrium as equilibrium or that ignores the waves once it occurs. It's like, don't get in there. It's just, oh, the waves is evidence that something went wrong, right? That there's something bad. C good critique in this sense, this new quality of the critique is, ah, the very participation in the wave. That's the new quality of critique. How do we participate in it? And that's always bringing in and bringing in and bringing in um, and doing something there. Um, and also too, I'll just add very quickly, um, indeed, uh, David Hume's whole understanding is that the very ability to critique um, and to say that there's no ground there can always keep occurring, creating an infinite wave. There's never equilibrium, but eventually that leads to philosophical melancholy uh, and hopelessness because you never get a new equilibrium. But David Hume also understood if you stay on the equilibrium, then you get empty, finality of evil, and so on and so forth. So it would seem that when we look at these kind of meta conversations, because if there is something about these conversations, which is the new quality of critique, to see what rises to the top, what stays in the net, and what does not, and that what you're doing is finding where one color ends and another begins, which is an experience of a limitation in the same way that you can refer to everything around you as shapes, but for Walter Benjamin, it's actually colors, where colors are becoming into other colors. In the conversations of the net, the wave then is a gradient, like a horizon when the sun is setting, where you see colors just going into other colors. You know when the sun sets, right? And you see the dark blue go into the yellow to the gray, and it goes all the way down. It would seem that experience of the gradient is something closer to what we're pointing at uh, when we talk about limits. And the only possibility of that gradient, that sunset gradient, would be for an equilibrium, the sky. Sky's all blue, but then at the end of the day, as the sun is reaching its limit on the horizon, what do we see? The emergence of a gradient. Colors coming into other colors and yet all part of the same tapestry. And it would seem that the nature of the game, in, these, in order to have intellectual critique, the critique must have the structure of the gradient that we see with a setting sun to introduce those sorts of colors. And that becomes the new equilibrium that then the next day begins with another gradient of the sunrise that then goes into the equilibrium of the midday when it's all blue. So Javier, thank you for going into your class and having the experience of a sunset because it made the opportunity for a new day next Thursday at 1.30. So thank you all. It has been a pleasure. I've enjoyed it immensely. Thank you.